I'm Andrew White, and I direct the Center for New York City Affairs, which organizes events like this one and does applied policy research on public education and community development and child and family policy in New York. Um, if you're watching online, you can join in the conversation with us on Twitter via the uh, hashtag Urban Agenda, and we're at Center NYC. I want to thank the family of Nathan Levin for establishing an endowment to support events such as this one. And I want to thank the Milano Foundation and the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco for making this evening's program possible. I also want to acknowledge um, our Board of Governors member Jeff Hodgman in the room and Deans Neil Graboy and David Scobie, who are around here. Um, before we hear from this evening's keynote speaker, I'm going to welcome my friend Larry Parks to the podium. Larry's a member of the Board of Gover Governors as well of the New School for Public Engagement, which is our division of the university. Larry's the Senior Vice President for External and Legislative Affairs at the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, and he works on housing and community development issues with Congress and the administration. And during the Clinton administration, he was Senior Policy Advisor to Commerce Secretary Ron Brown. Larry. Andrew's given me like three jobs. I guess that's what you get to do when you're on the board, right? You get to hand out jobs. So I got three things I'm supposed to do. One is to give you a little background on who Mr. Levin is. Second is to, is to give you a little framing of what tonight's discussion's about. And the third one is to introduce my friend Mark Morial. So uh, the last one is the easiest one. So the first one is to give you just a little understanding. Tonight is really we're really going to be talking about the urban agenda in the second Obama administration. Um, and so we're going to try to get into some controversial issues. Um, I have done these forums before with Congresswoman Waters. She did this one once before, and it was a very spirited discussion. I hope that that's the same way here. Um, the event is the annual Nathan Levin Lecture. Uh, these lectures on public policy were endowed in 1989 in honor of Nathan Levin. In private life, he was an industrialist and a financier, but he was involved with the New School for more than 40 years as a trustee. Uh, early in his career, Nathan Levin worked closely with Julius Rosenwald, the long-time president of Sears Roebuck Cor Corporation. And the two of them together provided seed money for the construction of thousands of schools for black students in the South. Later, Mr. Levin became president of the Reporter Magazine and chairman of Pantheon Books. He served on the board of directors of the Museum of Modern Art, the New York Hall of Science, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and Scientific and American Magazine. He was also president and treasurer of his own investment firm. Uh, Nathan Levin joined the New School's Board of Trustees in 1942, and he served until his death in 1988 at age 84. He was chairman of the Board of Trustees from 61 to 63, and he served as president of the university for the academic year of 60 to 61. Mr. Levin was one of a number of local civic leaders affiliated with the New School in the early 60s who, brought, who sought to promote the university's involvement in reform politics and community service, and I think that's where a lot of the urban agendas come from. Um, their vision ultimately led to the founding of the Center for New York City Affairs. The center became, began offering courses to help New Yorkers understand how to influence government policy. And those courses eventually became the Graduate School of Management and Urban Policy, a forerunner of what is now the Milano School. Today, a Milano education with, this, with a singular combination of policy and practice pr prepares our alumni to be especially effective in urban policy areas. Our students include it, our students include current and future policymakers, nonprofit leaders, labor and community activists, legislative staffers, and private sector executives. I'm sure Nathan Levin would be proud to see the urban program today and the continuation of the work of the Center for New York City Affairs, which remains a core program of the Milano Graduate School in International Affairs Management and Urban Policy. Uh, so I think we owe him uh, posthumously uh, a round of applause for all that he did for this school and continues to do. Now tonight, um, urban policy isn't dead, right? Uh, we've got a lot of controversies around it, which is a good thing, and that's why we wanted to do this. The president's urban agenda, just to give a little bit of a framework, I was asked to do a little bit about that, has basically been things like the Jobs Act, which did, wasn't passed, uh, the Health Care Act, uh, Obamacare, which I think has an, a very strong urban component, right? When you look at who's going to benefit from that, the locally based institutions just tend to be urban, the large urban hospitals. The infrastructure bank, which is in transition, right? It's constantly being proposed, not being funded. Does it happen? Does it not happen? 
Um, and then I think a lot of that he's done in education, education and training. So he sort of looked at the softer side more than the economic development side, where I think there's been a lot of energy spent around reforms, uh, both at the collegiate and primary and secondary level in education. And then there's some talk in the Jobs Act about broadband access and sort of communities that are locked out of the internet, what used to be called the internet superhighway, and how do you make sure that there's connectivity. Those have sort of been sort of the hallmarks. I, I'm not going to put environmental policy per se or energy policy per se, the little pieces of that, but these have been sort of the hallmarks of where the president has sort of laid claim to urban policy. The question I have for us and the panelists to look at are things like, did progressives have an urban agenda going into the first or the second term of the, of the Obama administration? Or did we put all the burden on the administration to develop an urban agenda? And if we did, what was it? And then the second part of that question is, did the agenda address structural racism and provide remedies for urban victims of structural racism? Because we can't ignore that that's the sleeping undertow of a lot of the divisions in America around urban policy, even though I think we've done a really good job media-wise of trying to duck those questions. The second one is economic development and jobs. Um, urban unemployment and, and underemployment is nearly twice, if not more, than that of suburban unemployment. Jobs are clearly the critical issue for the last election and continue to be the critical election, uh, uh, issue. Um, and at the same time, we're dealing with shrinking state and local government jobs, which have been sort of the underpinning of the working and middle class of most central cities. Um, the government response to date has been education and training, the federal government response, someone on health care, someone on infrastructure. Um, is that enough? Is that what needs to happen in economic development to make to actually to allow cities to be ladders up for economic development? The third question or framework I'd, I'd like you guys to look at is cities as the economy of the future. This is the positive side, right? Um, if transportation is the foundation of economic development, as some have argued, including um, one of the articles written by one of our panelists tonight. Um, and the 50-year plan from 1956 on was the highway system, which was basically a suburbanization of employment and opportunity. What are we going to do to make sure that the, if cities are the economy of the future, what does transportation, what do all these other policies begin to look like? Uh, what does an infrastructure bank look like, if you're going to look at it as an economic development en engine? And then the last piece of that question is really, the cities are at a crossroads. You've got, on the one hand, you've got gentrification, and what does that mean about a middle retaining a middle class? On the other hand, and those are the cities like New York, obviously, right? Boston, San Francisco, Washington, Los Angeles, the, the kind of named cities, right? And then you've got the troubled cities. And what's the strategy for relief? Because I think one of the things that a lot of progressives struggle with is that there hasn't been a policy around that since the late 60s. And sort of what, what are we going to do to really deal with the unfinished business of 1968 when those, when those cities really s moved into trouble and we kind of create, didn't really create a fix? So with that, those are the questions I would hope that we could get at, hear from your panelists. <laughs> I see the panelists look at me like, what? <laughs> this was not a sabotage? OK. And lastly, um, my last job, then you don't have to hear from me anymore, is really to talk about um, Mark Morial, who's the president of the Urban League and executive director of the Urban League. Um, I know Mark uh, from his days as mayor of New Orleans. I think he's done a fabulous job at the Urban League. I think New York is very lucky to have him. I think the country is very lucky to have him committed to the issues as, as the premier civil rights organization in the country. And it's very important. However, he will always be mayor to me. And I'm not from New Orleans, but he will always be because of two things that Mark did in the face of the 1990s lacking in urban policy. One was, when I first got to really know Mark, he called me down to New Orleans as part of a panel to look at as he took over the urban, the uh, National Cal uh, Conferences, League of Cities, League of, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And he wanted to understand sort of what was going on in urban policy around the country. He did a convening of all the mayors. He sort of began to learn about Clinton's reform agenda and what, what he was doing. And he sort of tried to implement some of the stuff that the DLC was talking about at the time. And one of them was, this was during the time of privatization of government services, it was really popular. So Mark says, okay, I privatized the trash collectors. And I, I took them out, and I said, okay, you're gonna, we're gonna make them private, private sector activities, until I watched in the news one night, one guy gets cut. And I find out the contractor who had his contract didn't have health insurance. So he said, the next day, the trash collectors went back on the city payroll. And from that, I knew that what it took to be a mayor was much more than being an economic genius. It took to be a sociolo sociologist and have a heart. 
and actually connect with the people and the voters. And that's why Mark did two terms. And that's why I think if Mark had been in charge when Katrina happened, we would have had a very different outcome to the result. So he will always be the mayor. He will always be the guy who, who is the bridge between the troubled cities and the successful cities of today and can tell both stories and brings all that to the Urban League and I think brings that, all that to this forum tonight. So with that, Mark Morial. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, let me thank you, Larry, for generous, kind, and powerful remarks, and thank you for all of your work. And uh, let me thank the entire New School community uh, for inviting me here. I shared that I had an uncle who attended the New School way back in the 1960s, uh, and remember him talking with great affection about his education here. He got a master's degree in economics, and then worked on his PhD and got, uh, got anxious and didn't finish his dissertation. Uh, but uh, have we have, I have great affection for the work and, and for what this school and its community represents. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the urban agenda and the Obama administration. Uh, and I think it's helpful to start with a very simple question, and that is, what is a city and where did it come from? Uh, I learned, if, if you've really studied this, the city was actually the first unit of government and social organization. Way back a long time ago as the dinosaurs went away. And it was people coming together to collaborate around hunting and securing food, protection from uh, enemies, marshaling of resources, and trading and exchanging with other communities and other people. Cities came before states. Cities came before nations. The city is, in fact, the original unit of government. What are cities today? Uh, I'll use a story uh, that was shared with me uh, about the governor of the great state of Louisiana who went to Tokyo on a job hunting tour, had an opportunity to speak to a group, a large room of Japanese business people. And with great enthusiasm and fervor, he said, I am the governor of Louisiana. And they all look like you're looking now. And then he said, I am from New Orleans. And they all clapped. They all cheered. They all said, oh yes, jazz music. We are defined by, <laughs> we are known by, we are understood by, we are branded by, whatever term you want to use, by cities. People may not know Pennsylvania, but they know the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection, Philadelphia. They may not know Illinois, but they know Chicago. Same for San Francisco. Same for Los Angeles or New Orleans or Houston or Miami. We are defined as a nation by our great cities. What you may not know about our cities, but may have a sense of, and speaking to people that study urban affairs, is that cities are indeed the economic engines of the nation. And cities today, in my view, are defined not simply by the traditional boundaries of the city, but the economic entity that the city represents. The best definition is that they may be defined by media markets. So here, metropolitan New York City, while it's the five boroughs, it's also northern New Jersey. It's also parts of Long Island. It's also parts of Connecticut that are part of this instrumentality called the city. Cities are the places where we have all of our dynamic transportation infrastructure. They're where ports are located. They're where airports are located. They're where, where both freight and passenger rail facilities are primarily located. Cities are where great institutions of higher education are located. 
great institutions of higher education. Think of New York City with New School or NYU or Columbia or the CUNY system or many other, Fordham, many other private institutions of higher education. Cities are where great cultural institutions are located. Our museums, our libraries, our living cultural institutions in my own hometown like New Orleans, the Jazz and Heritage Festival is a living, breathing cultural institution. Cities are places where we share things. We share sanitation services. We share sidewalks. We share land usage. We share, we share water facilities. Cities have been the defining, if you will, institutions of the advance of the 20th century in the United States of America. And cities are all too often seen, all too often seen by those in the mainstream media and narrow-minded, short-sighted politicians as the places where most of America's problems evolve from. And cities are, yes they are, the places that br bring us in confrontation with some of the most difficult challenges we face as a nation, be it violence, be it issues of race and culture, be it issues of poverty and economic inequality. Cities, cities, cities define, if you will, much of the greatness of the nation and many of the challenges that the nation indeed faces. So cities are critically and crucially important. In my own state, and this is a case in many states, if I went into a room of kindergarten or first or second or third grade students and you ask the kindergarten first or second grade students, who is the president of the United States? They would know immediately. Who is the mayor of my hometown? They would know immediately. Who is the governor of my state? Not one child could answer that question in most states, big cities and states across the nation. Cities are definitional, they're defining, they're crucial, they're important. There's been much talk and much angst and about the president, his administration, uh, and the existence of or the lack thereof of an urban policy. Uh, I wanna talk and share with you what I think are the Obama administration's urban accomplishments urban accomplishments. And I think to many, in many respects, what I'll share with you, some of the things I'll share with you are things that the president and his, and his administration have advanced with success, but have never been defined, never been communicated, never been advanced, if you will, as an urban policy. Number one, the signature achievement one of the signature achievements of the president's first term is the Affordable Health Care Act. How many of you, like me, have spent untold hours and time over the last 30 years, or 20, or 10, whatever your span of life may be, reading, talking, participating in workshops, symposium, dissertations, position papers on the issue of closing health care disparities, finding a way to insure the uninsured. I can't count the number of times. It brings me all the way back to courses I took in college, discussions we had in high school, all the way back. And then the Affordable Health Care Act takes place. Why is it an urban accomplishment because too many of the Americans who are uninsured are people who reside in urban communities. Many of the Americans who will be able to take advantage of an expanded Medicare program are people who reside in urban communities. This was the expansion of Medicaid in my own view 
it was the backdoor public option. Never defined as such, but it emerged on the table when the public option left the table in the policy debate in Congress. Many of the Americans who are going to benefit from a focus, uh, a thrust, a renewed emphasis or an emphasis on prevention and better health are residents of urban communities. Now, no one has said the Affordable Health Care Act is indeed an urban public policy measure. They may not say it, but I'll say it, because in my own view, it is. And that's why so many of us, like me, were full force, full square behind the passage of the Affordable Care Act, even with its imperfections and its challenges. It's better than what we had before, and it's going to change the quality of life over time, over generations, for many, many Americans. The president, at the beginning of his first term, uh, embraced the nation, uh, embraced the idea that the economy absolutely needed a jolt. We were losing 700,000 jobs per month. So he defined, he positioned, he designed with partners in Congress the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. You got to love those Washington acronyms, right? You got to love it. They should have just said this is a Job Restoration Act, the JRA. But that historic economic stimulus package, uh, along with the automobile industry rescue plan, uh, invested significant public dollars inside into urban communities in a way that helped to stabilize and prevent, prevent the economy from worsening and help to encourage it. Did we in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act get all of us who are passionate urban advocates, did we get exactly everything we wanted? Absolutely not. Many of us wanted a larger package. Many of us wanted uh, investments that were indeed more targeted. But the GM and Chrysler Rescue saved jobs in Rust Belt urban communities and in Sun Belt urban community because unbeknownst and untalked about is the fact that much, much of the infrastructure that builds automobiles that exists in this country is no longer solely in the Midwest. They're in the Sun Belt, they're in the far west, they're in lots of medium-sized communities all across the nation. It made a difference in the quality of life for urban residents. Therefore, to me, it was an urban accomplishment. The Dodd-Frank bill. The Dodd-Frank legislation was indeed, it's a complicated, hard to understand piece of financial regulatory legislation, no doubt. But there are components in there, components in there, particularly the effort to undo and prevent any return to predatory lending practices, which devastated home ownership in urban communities, particularly devastated home ownership amongst communities of color. If the Dodd-Frank Act prevents that from occurring again in the future, it is a bill that will benefit, benefit urban communities and represents an urban accomplishment. Now, none of this in the frame in which I give it has been defined by many people who hold the public pulpit in Washington, D.C. I will concede that fact. But students and practitioners, students and practitioners and aficionados of cities and urban communities have to look beyond the surface of the headlines. And even papers you respect, like, is it the New York Times or Washington Post? Or is it the New York Post? What? <laughs> Look beyond the headlines and the photographs 
to define. We did have a time under Presidents Carter and Clinton to some great extent where there was an effort to publicly define one's policy as a comprehensive urban policy. In these times where we live today, there has not been the same kind of energy and effort to do it. But it would be a mistake to say because it hasn't been defined that way. It hasn't been packaged that way. It hasn't been communicated that way. That there are not aspects that meet the test of being accomplishments that benefit urban communities. And I think that's a very important thing. So a few thoughts about the current and the future. I point everyone's attention to the president's current budget document. And the budget document in Washington, D.C. is like the strategic plan for the nation. And that budget document includes a number of things in there that caught my eye and increased my enthusiasm. First of all, there is the Promise Zone Initiative. And Larry, you know that the Promise Zone Initiative is really a remake and a repackaging of a Clinton era initiative, which was an expansion of a Jack Kemp idea. The Jack Kemp idea being enterprise zones, pretty focused only on tax relief, taken by Clinton with cash added and an expanded set of incentives that became the empowerment zone program of the 1970s, of the 1990s rather. Now in the age of President Obama, He's got a new initiative, the Promise Zone program, and his budget plan proposes 15 of these Promise Zones in urban communities and five in rural communities focused on areas that are the most distressed and that are the most locked out and left out. But it has to pass the Congress in order to become law. Number two, the, the expansion of early childhood education and a way to pay for it. The president's proposal is to pay for it with an increase in the tobacco tax. Again, this must see the light of day. But for the president to recommend a dramatic expansion of early childhood education, if we can accomplish this, if this takes effect, it's gonna have a dramatic effect on poor children here in the United States and poor children who live in urban communities. Because for all of the education reform, public policy efforts, you cannot fix the problem of education by starting in third grade. You can't even fix it by starting in first grade. You've got to start when children are young, expose them to learning and social development. If you're middle class in America, if you're upper middle class in America, and you have a young child, they're gonna be in school at age three, invariably and no doubt. This is an important part of this budget that could benefit urban communities in a significant way. Third is the American Jobs Act. We'd like to think that the American Jobs Act is a very good bill and we take some credit that parts of it were cut and pasted from the National Urban League's 12-point jobs plan, which we presented to the president in 2011. It's a set of ideas that uh, we put together, we presented it to the president, and when he addressed the Congress in fall of 2011 to, at a joint session and proposed the American Jobs Act, it did include some of the recommendations that we had advanced. This has not seen the light of day the same reason why gun safety legislation has not seen the light of day. It's this antiquated, archaic, abused device called the filibuster. Last time I checked, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and Alexander Hamilton didn't write that into the Constitution, didn't write it into any of the early laws. It's an invention of 20th century politicians early 20th century politicians, risen to a level of abuse by 21st century politicians. And it's got all the chattering political press in Washington 
running around saying it takes 60 votes to pass a bill in the United States Senate. No, it takes 60 votes to pass a resolution to have a vote to pass a bill that takes 50 votes. So you got to pass, get 60 people to agree to vote before 50 people can vote to say yes. It's an archaic thing. The American Jobs Act never saw the light of day, but it's been reproposed by the president in this administration. Let me give you some thoughts going forward uh, that I believe we should think about from a long term. One thing is, I read earlier this year, and it's an idea that I feel that we should embrace, and that is to create a new department in government called the Department of Cities. Uh, the idea is, is that the Department of Housing and Urban Development, created in the middle 1960s, has had a history of being a department that's been emphasized, an apartment, the department that's been de-emphasized. We need, I think, a new approach to take portions and strands of what happens at HUD, education, to have a more place-based focus on public policy. And I would take it one further and say it should be the Department of Cities and Towns. Because in America today, there are, and Larry mentioned this, there are these mega metro economic entities, New York, Boston, Washington, Philadelphia, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, Phoenix, Miami, but then there's cities like Jackson, Mississippi, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Albany, New York, Shreveport, Louisiana. They are cities. Uh, they are not mega cities, but they're cities of two, three, four, five hundred thousand metro area. And I think in thinking of what type of governmental infrastructure we ought to create in the 21st century, it ought to match. It ought to match what we are in the 21st century. 50 years ago, when people thought cities, they thought of the 25 largest cities in America. The suburbs were not well developed except around certain northeastern city. The concept of exurbs did not exist. The interstate highway systems were new. Suburban sprawl. Now we have something very different. The suburbs are urban. The suburbs are urban. Just visit parts of Westchester County, Prince George's County in Maryland, Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, on the outskirts of New Orleans. They are urban. They are dense. They have infrastructure that's crumbling and eroding. They have a growing multicultural population. They have pressure on their fiscal demands. They have population density that rivals our cities. It's a different lens through which we must look at the 21st century's problem. So we need to think about a new approach and I don't think this is something we should rush into, but I think it's worthy of study, worthy of some analysis, to see if there are advocates down the line who embrace this idea. The Department of Homeland Security was created after the crisis of 9-11 and pulled together pieces of other departments that had been scattered about to create more of an emphasis on the security of the domestic front. The Department of Energy, when it was created in the 1970s, pulled together pieces of other departments. Same and ditto for HUD, ditto for the Department of uh, Education. All of these have been efforts to create more coherence around something specific, some specific component. And I think we are becoming a much more urban nation with urban and cities being defined differently. We need to take a new approach. Number two, what is the role that the federal government can play? And what is the role that the federal government should play in developing cities? 
So if you're, if you're a business person and you analyze where you put your money, you like to use this term called return on investment. I wonder if you went back and calculated the return on investment of the New York subway system. Can you imagine New York without its subway system? This city would probably be a city, instead of, of eight million, probably a city of maybe two, two and a half to three million. It would be a city with even more horrific traffic jams, congestion, and challenges beyond anything anyone can imagine today. Therefore, if you went back and said, let's calculate the return on investment, on the original investment of time and money in building the New York subway system. I'll go back and talk to Fiorello LaGuardia about when he took a little peninsula out in Queens and created the New York International Airport later LaGuardia Airport, and what the return on investment is for that particular investment by the taxpayers. We need a new dialogue and conversation when we look at what we should do with cities. So we need a new thrust when it comes to increasing investments in urban transportation, rail, et cetera, airports, ports, a new conversation about investments in community facilities, schools, libraries, community centers, and the like. Water and wastewater infrastructure, which in many cities is approaching or in excess of 100 years old, we need a new thought process and a new emphasis on doing this. One idea that's been out there is the infrastructure bank. An idea that I'd like to advance tonight is a new version of the new markets tax credits provision that would be a public infrastructure tax credit that would leverage private dollars into public works projects because we have got to rebuild. I can tell you, you go back and talk to the Romans. I wonder if they had any idea that the Colosseum they built back in those days would still be standing today and that every single arena and stadium built in the world since that time was modeled off of that Roman Colosseum. Investing in infrastructure has never been a bad bet for any society or any nation. It creates quality of life and jobs. It is a legitimate role for the federal government to invest in the rebuilding of Boston and Baltimore the same way we are investing in the rebuilding of Baghdad and Kandahar. There is an urban infrastructure plan in the federal budget. It's just not for Boston and Baltimore. It's for some cities, some place overseas. We need to emphasize this. Secondly, cities must focus on the issue of public safety. I spoke yesterday at Columbia and shared that it was a deep disappointment that the Congress had failed, the Senate had failed to pass even a modest gun safety bill that expanding background checks and closing the loopholes. But I shared with them what I'd share with you now, that simply passing gun safety legislation, a background check bill, even if you expanded it to things that we support, like uh, bans on assault weapons and limitations on high capacity magazine clips, is not enough to deal with the violence that exists in American cities, counties, towns, villages, and rural areas. Newtown was not a big city. Aurora 
was in the suburbs of Denver. We've got to recognize that this problem is indeed pervasive and it requires, it requires addressing underlying difficult economic problems, the need for investments in young people and youth, a whole host of very important things. Cities must focus on the objective of a safer community. Cities must focus on one thing that is a powerful and beautiful part of American cities that's not discussed enough, and that is the city's multicultural mosaic, its tapestry, its gumbo, its rainbow, whatever you want to call it. It is cities in America where people of different ethnicities, races, religions, backgrounds, cultures, had, had to figure out how to exist side by side, sharing power, sharing vision, sharing differences, and sharing challenges. And I wouldn't suggest here today that we've got it right or that any city is a perfect model indeed for doing this. But cities, cities today and cities to some extent yesterday is where America will be in the mid 21st century. Many American cities today do not have majority ethnic groups. They're made up of people of all backgrounds, all religions, all races, it requires a different thought process about how you govern, about how you build a community, about how you're inclusive. It's a challenging thing for leadership. Mayors and local elected officials live and breathe it or they'll be out of office. They live it, they have to breathe it. For cities to focus on enhancing and developing and recognizing that this is a challenge. And cities must focus on income inequality and poverty. The growing income inequality that is really a cancer eating away at this country. The growing gulf between the haves, the have mores, and the have nots the growing income disparity that's even uh, gotten worse in post-recession America. It will be an issue, you have not heard the last of it here tonight from me at this mic that's gonna continue to challenge it. And the reason why we've got to challenge ourselves and city leaders and urban leaders have to challenge themselves on this issue is because one of the great successes of the 20th century was between 1945 and 1980, the closing of the economic gap, the lifting of the bottom and the top together. It was a remarkable period. Public policy, population growth, a number of things had something to do with it but we've had a different experience as a nation since 1980, where we've had growing income inequality and growing wealth disparities made much worse by the recession that we've been through. So let me close by simply saying this. I think that we, with President Obama, I do believe we have had a president who has been sensitive to uh, interested in the concerns of the urban community. I secondly believe he's had accomplishments that have benefited the urban community. Some of us, and I'm in this because I love cities and believe in cities and believe that cities are drivers of the economic success of the nation, would like to have a larger public discussion where every policy that we undertake, whether it's transportation policy, whether it's economic policy, there is a discussion. There's a discussion about what will this do to benefit the American city and its residents 
and the challenges that it face, that it faces. And I think that those of you and those of us owe it to ourselves to encourage that discussion. But secondly, this is also a time for us to think beyond, to think to 10, to think to 20, to think to 25 years, because I do think that as cities go, so goes the nation. And as the nation goes, so goes cities. But cities are drivers, and cities can indeed make a difference. Thank you for listening to me tonight. I appreciate you very much. One last word. Uh, I'd like all of you to take down our website, nul.org. If you're on Twitter, please follow me on Twitter, at Mark Morial. Uh, we're going to have a major announcement on March, May 20th in Cleveland, Ohio. The National Urban League is announcing its own Jobs Rebuild America initiative. We're going to be expanding after-school programs in 35 cities, uh, uh, launching new job training programs in some 17 to 20 communities. Uh, we're going to be launching a new small business lending platform called the Urban Empowerment Fund. We're going to be doing, we are going to be doing some things on our own to try to enhance through our affiliate network. So please follow us. Thank you very much. All right. Why don't the other panelists come on up? Mark. Hey. How you doing? Hey. All right. So, uh, yeah, I feel, you know, listening to that, I feel like New York is a caricature or a poster child of so much of what you say. With, um, you know, the, the have-mores and the have-nots to the extreme in New York City. But also this epic transformation of this city over the last 27 years or so that I've lived here watching the neighborhoods transform, the population transform. The, the ethnic mix getting closer and closer to parity, you know, of whites, blacks, Latinos, Asians. I can see in another 15 years, it'll be 25% each, if even. Um, so you've given us a lot to work with. I want to introduce our three other panelists. At the far end of the table is Dorian Warren. He is associate professor in the Department of Political Science at SEPA, Columbia and at the Institute for Research in African American Studies, and he's also a fellow of the Roosevelt Institute. Um, next to him is Mark Winston Griffith, who is executive director of the Brooklyn Movement Center. He was on the faculty of CUNY Graduate School of Journalism until recently, and a field organizer for Move New York. Uh, also um, former ED of the Neighborhood Economic, or co-ED of Neighborhood Economic Development Advocacy Project, and um, executive Director of Drum Major Institute. <clears throat> Shin Pei Tse is Director of Cities and Transportation in the Energy and Climate Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she, she researches and develops policy to reduce climate change um, and, its, and its impacts on urban dwellers and infrastructure systems. So we have a tremendous range of knowledge, just like the topic we've just been you know, presented <coughs> covers so many, so many different issues. The Census Bureau now reports that 81% of the U.S. population lives in urbanized areas. And that's a wide definition, but when you break that down, nearly two-thirds of America live in, lives in urban areas with populations of more than 200,000 people. Like America's politics, it's also a regional divide. If you look at the coasts, nearly everyone lives in a metro area. When you get into the interior, the Midwest and the South, you find the numbers go down. And kind of amazingly, if you, um, Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Tennessee are the least urban areas of the, of the country with just over half the population living in metro areas. So in looking at those, Statistics, I struggle with the question about what exactly is an urban agenda and what makes any policy specifically urban as opposed to national. If most of us live in cities, why isn't it, why isn't urban policy just federal policy? 
And then how do we differentiate between the cities and places like New York and DC and Boston? Economies continue to grow even as these deeper problems um, like affordability and inequality persist. And even in our cities, unemployment, uh, even in these cities, unemployment has taken a huge toll. In the Bronx, the unemployment rate is now nearly 12%. It's lower than it was a year ago, but it's still 12% and much higher for young men. And citywide, public housing is in trouble, and almost one in four New Yorkers is receiving food stamps. And yet this town is very healthy compared to Detroit or Cleveland or Youngstown or Scranton or even other cities in New York State. So um, I want to put to the table, I guess we'll start with Dorian, you know, how do you define an urban agenda? Um, you've heard uh, Mr. Morales description, how would you break that down and what are sort of the, the most important elements? That's so unfair. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to do it. <clears throat> well, I was thinking, uh, and thank, first of all, thanks for inviting me here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your comments. Um, I was thinking about your question actually right before you were asking it, just in a different way, and that is, if it's true that 81% of us live in cities, then how is it that, as you just said, all federal policy really is an urban policy? And then when you start to unpack that question, it takes you to the House of Representatives mm -hmm. and the way in which we draw our congressional districts. And so when you think about the 435 <coughs> members of the House and you ask yourself, well, is there an urban caucus in the House of Representatives and do they have power to push an urban agenda? You would assume the answer would be yes, but the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And it goes to the ways in which we draw our districts, our congressional districts, so that actually federal power is suburban and exurban and rural. And in fact, if, if you look at the Senate, if you look at the other chamber, it actually disadvantages cities to an even larger extent because it, it values, you know, our system values, when we have two senators, big states in terms of land, not population. So it's land over population, actually, which disadvantages urban centers. So in the Senate, never has urban interests at its heart. And then at the House of Representatives level, we're outnumbered essentially because of how we arbitrarily draw our districts by suburban, exurban, and rural interests. So it's a much more difficult picture that we're dealing with in terms of how to make federal policy urban policy. Yeah. That's not an exact answer to your question, but I'm just pointing out that the, that's the challenge, I think, for us in terms of federal policy and governance. Right, right. Mark, what would you Andrew. say, you know, pick three or four <laughs> key issues. So we've got politics clearly as the great barrier. What would you put on the table as the key urban issues of the moment? <laughs> Don't you love it when you get prepped for these things and what you prep for is never what you're asked, Ooh. right? <laughs> but I'll, Can I answer Mark's question? I'll <laughs> yeah, right. For that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, geez, that sounds, sounds like a Sophie's choice, right? I mean, yeah. how, how do we make those kinds of how do we make those kinds of priorities? I mean, I, I would say that for me, someone who works on a community organizing level, um, what I see up front and center, and this conforms to some of the things we work on, is um, education. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, although we can say that early childhood education is so important and Head Start is so important, we, we, we see that the benefits from Head Start and early childhood ben, um, education start to you know, drop off as, as kids get older. So education, housing, um, of course, we see in the uh, sequ sequestration, yeah, you know that, um, that, that housing vouchers um, are, are being dropped and they just had a, a, an artic, a, a story on NPR today talking about that. Um, you know, I think that there are issues that are not necessarily sexy and people are thinking about um, every day, but obviously transportation mm -hmm. um, is, is a big issue. And um, everyone feels the, the effects of, of crime. Um, so, you know, I, 
you, you asked for four, I could give you four more, um, but we can, we can right. dig down a little bit deeper in, later on. Which is kind of the point. I just want <laughs> right. to see what you think is most okay. important. Shinpei. Um, well, I... <laughs> Uh, which was building on Dorian's comments, actually. I think the structural uh, issues are loom extremely large, and even when the administration has tried to introduce place-based uh, strategies in its, um, let's say, interagency cooperation, so uh, Peter Orzag, Melody Barnes, um, the Office of Urban Affairs, and Larry Summers, who is obviously the, econ uh, the, economic, the senior economic advisor, put together a place-based memo that basically directed all the agencies to consider uh, program structures that would target beyond the states, directly to the citizens, and that's why you get things like Partnership for Sustainable Communities and re Regional Innovation Clusters. The problem with that is that an executive order is not good public policy, it's not institutionalized, it's constantly under attack by Congress. And so then you go back to the structure of our governance system, which is very state land, pref, land um, dominated versus population dominated. Um, you have senators who are able to take longer term views on issues, but uh, their constituents may not have that preference. And then you have um, the House, which looks at part of their job as being reelected every two years. So you have significant uh, long term uh, barriers to really addressing this topic and um, you know I'm going to join your cause on working on this urban agenda because I think one of the main things we need to do is figure out how much of us the general American population is really impacted by the barriers to developing this urban agenda yeah it's true um, I mean these political system questions I find myself increasingly <laughs> the last few days um, well particularly since gun control failed but but Beyond that, you begin to think, okay, I guess it, it's better than a dictatorship, but <laughs> but there are real serious limits. And, and Dorian, you spelled it out pretty clearly in terms of the limits of the House um, not representing <coughs> cities. Since we're on that topic, I wasn't really going to start there, but politics is fundamental here. One question I have is in, in terms of, you know, we've gerrymandered the House so thoroughly. One other piece that's now being considered in the Supreme Court. I mean, to what degree does the Voting Rights Act actually um, strengthen the hand of the Republicans by consolidating liberals and, and um, African Americans and Latinos in a handful of districts and thus sort of giving more power to those who aren't in those districts? The truth is, is that the Voting Rights Act doesn't really envision uh, and, and maybe it's not as strong a tool to prevent what's called packing, mm -hmm. right? Packing people into geographic, into districts in an effort to uh, 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 enhance the power of someone else. But look, pay close attention to the Supreme Court's deliberations on Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act because to lose it would be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. uh, my own state, Louisiana, uh, for the first time in 2010, wrote a reapportionment plan for its state legislature that wasn't blocked by the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. Every single plan they wrote, 1970, 1980, 1990, and 2000, was blocked by the Justice Department, or they would have impact, they would have they would have passed a plan and put it into law, which seriously diluted mm -hmm. African American voters, who in a state like Louisiana are very concentrated in cities like New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Shreveport and Monroe, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that if I can raise something that 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 is a concern of mine, uh, we had. In 2012, for the first time in American history, we actually had a, an election where African-American turnout exceeded white turnout mm -hmm. for the first time in American history. Now, how many of you all vote in New York? How many of you all vote in New York? Uh, one of the things that really, really shocked me moving here to New York was how low voter turnout is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. how low voter turnout is here, how so many people have become sort of checked out. 
you have higher turnout when you have a vote for <coughs> the president, yep. but it still barely gets to 50%. You have probably, we'll see with the mayor's race, whether you get to 50% turnout. Doubtful. But when you have a democracy, separate from the rules and the laws, where large numbers of people who are actually on the rolls to vote do not bother to vote, do not take the time to vote. In some cases, there may be some barriers. There's a larger issue in the body politic. And so one of the things that I think is that if cities fully exercise their political voting potential by turning out in large numbers in statewide elections, the impact would be dramatic and it would be felt. Many people rely on low voter turnout to win elections. Some of them engage in active suppression. Some get down on their knees and pray for rain. <laughs> but they rely on low voter turnout right. to win elections. So all the comments that were made I think are very important, but this is a larger issue. Uh, where I come from, we routinely, before 2000, had voter turnout in state and municipal elections above 70%. It was common. It was, a, every election was vigorously contested, vigorously fought, and you had very high voter turnout. So we've got to really work. Uh, we've got to address and we've got to confront why is civic engagement on, on the part of many, many people so low. They don't have confidence that the people they elect are going to do anything. Uh, that could be a reason. Uh, they uh, 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 do not like their choices. But whatever it is, we have to reinstill. And because I grew up in the South and because for my grandparents and, par and parents, the denial to vote, was a really, really big thing. I grew up in a household where from the time I was, can even remember, the idea that on your 18th birthday, you were gonna go down and register to vote and that you were gonna vote in every election. And my parents took me to the voting polls every time they voted so that it was ingrained. We've gotta do something to re-engineer, re-inspire, re-instill. If we did it, a city like New York City would be the overwhelming determining factor in every statewide election. It would not change the electoral college vote unless you want to say it's time to do something other than do something with the electoral college. Mm -hmm. So there's some structural. The electoral college is one. The reapportionment system is another. The way in which the Senate and the Senate rules are constructed is a third that do have a limiting effect, but se separating all of that, just increasing civic engagement mm -hmm. is something we need to yeah. think about. Dorian. So I can't resist. I'm from Chicago, so you know our saying is vote early, vote often. Yeah, yeah, I have a high turnout. Oh. But, but I just want to second Memorial's <laughs> comments and, and raise a, a related issue, and that is the role of state politics which is really important. We, we tend, whenever we have these discussions, we tend to be seduced by national politics. And the Obama administration, it's very sexy. We want to talk about it. State politics is much more boring, but arguably more important, and for at least two reasons. One is the resources that are distributed to cities are based on the decisions made in Albany. So just in terms of a pure resource, how much will New York City get back from the taxes that we pay as residents from the state government? That is a very simple notion. But secondly, redistricting every 10 years. Right. It's state government that is in charge of redistricting in terms of our federal representation. So for those two reasons, state politics is very important. And then there's a third reason, and this gets to the politics of cities and states. Cities and states have always been the place for the most innovative experiments in politics. And one of the issues that the mayor, Mayor Morial, brought up is income inequality. And there's been ex really exciting innovations in cities around this question of income inequality. 
in 10 years, we're going to have federal paid sick leave. I know we barely got it in New York. But, but New York and actually other cities beat us to the punch. Right? Cities are innovating on that. It'll take the federal government at least a decade to catch up. And that's how it almost has always been in terms of our, our most significant policy innovation. So if we take an example like San Francisco, the minimum wage in San Francisco, the federal minimum wage is $7.25. and In San Francisco, it's $10.54. and Citywide. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed paid sick leave. San Francisco as a city had guaranteed health insurance for every resident way before the Affordable Care Act. So cities, and that's one, just one example, are the places where we can experiment. If we participate, we could actually win victories that address income inequality, that address jobs, transportation, <coughs> all of these issues we've just listed out. Cities are the place where we have the most amount of leverage to actually make a difference, to innovate, and then try to push it up to the federal level. Right. Mark, can I just make a comment? I mean, I, I, I agree with all that, but I, I, I do think it goes beyond that. I mean, I think it starts kind of here in this room, and for us to have a much more, I think, honest conversation about public policy and its effects on people, and to talk about it in such a way where people don't feel like we're just sort of rearranging the, 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 the lawn furniture. I mean, um, I, I think that it's important to recognize the Obama administration, um, the, the, the positive things in its policy, but let, let's, let's remember that this administration started off with this idea that there was going to be um, this office created that was going to be a center for thinking and progressive action um, in urban America. And, and Adolfo Corrion ended up becoming the director of it. Um, and where it, from where it began to where it ended, um, well, I guess technically hasn't ended yet, um, but the expectations um, have dropped so significantly. Um, and I think that we need to not just sort of push that under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we need to introduce sort of a, 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 a progressive public policy uh, around urban, you know, an urban, this urban agenda. Um, and we need to sort of close the gap that I think currently exists between advocacy organizations and think tanks and quite frankly, you know, community, orga um, community organizers and, and what folks are doing there because there's a big gap with the, the research, the policy recommendations that are being made, and what people, I think, are sort of feeling and experiencing on the ground. While I don't think there's a correl while obviously there's a correlation between the two, I don't think it's being communicated very well. Right. Um, and so I think that it's our job in this room um, to begin to address some of those harder questions become very honest about the impact of our policies. Yeah. So a few months ago in his State of the Union address, Obama said, America, quote, America is not a place where chance of birth or circumstance should decide our destiny. And that is why we need to build ladders of opportunity into the middle class for all who are willing to climb them. And I think that feeds into sort of a conventional wisdom about jobs and development and uplift and moving people into the middle class. And yet at the same time in New York, one out of four, almost one out of four New Yorkers are on food stamps. Um, the numbers, uh, more than 1.8 million New Yorkers received more than three and a half billion dollars in food stamps last year. City residents claim nearly three billion in EITC payments. And I'm not saying those are necessarily bad things. I mean, that's, that is our new safety net. Right? Instead of welfare, that's our safety net. But are we essentially subsidizing those low-wage jobs through those mechanisms? And yeah, is I mean, that a legitimate you know, safety net? You, you, you know, if anyone look, just looks at the research, just look at the numbers, just look at the numbers, it's stunning. I'm reading a book uh, by Hydric Smith. I don't know if some, any of you have seen this book. It's about the loss of the American dream. And there's been a lot of research on this that documents... Uh, the way that wage rates uh, have not, except for the top 20 percent, mm -hmm. have not kept pace with <laughs> inflation for 30 years, 30 plus years. 
Now, what happened? Americans were able to mask the fact that wage rates were not keeping pace with inflation with credit cards, mm -hmm. predatory loans, all sorts of devices. So a person or family that made twenty-five dollars or $30,000 a year could figure out a way to make $10,000 more in expenditures on a credit card and never really pay it off and just pay something and keep it rolling and push it down the, down the world. It masked the underlying issue. So today, the top 50%, the top, the top 20%, excuse me, own, earn, I was talking about income, not wealth, earn 50% of the income in the United States. 20% gets 50%. The bottom 20 gets 3.5%. When you put wealth on top of that, the numbers are even much more dramatic. So there's a gap between rich and poor. There's a gap between black and white, a gap between white and Latino. We have a, a cauldron of disparity. We used to pride ourselves on having one of the lowest income disparities in the world. And now we're falling behind some countries that we used to consider to be emerging economies. This is a, gonna be a 21st century issue of large proportions. So a short run measure, short run measure that the Congress could take or states could take it too, is to simply raise the minimum wage and index it to inflation. Index it to inflation so that Congress doesn't have to continuously and constantly vote. We got, what, one raise or two, one in the minimum wage in the last 10 years? It's, 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 it's not a whole lot. Now, raising the minimum wage by itself doesn't close the income gap. It sends a template. It sets a fundamental value about what work is worth. What is work worth, mm -hmm. that we want to value work. And you made a point that is important, and that is, are you subsidizing through EITC the working poor? The poor who are working 40 hours a week or more, some working two jobs, and even with that, are still struggling to pay rent. And some have a combination of food stamps, EITC, Section 8 certificate. Right. And family members collaborating and pitching in to try to make ends meet. That's absolutely the truth. And we need to change the view that people have. <coughs> that people, people who are, I don't like the term poor, I like the term broke. right? Because <laughs> they're not poor in spirit, not poor in intention, not poor in attitude. Uh, that many of the Americans that we're talking about, many of the people we're talking about, they work. They get up and they work. They work every single day. We're not talking simply about the caricature of the shiftless, lazy, unmotivated person. We're talking about people who actually work. Right. And the working poor need new advocacy in the nation. Right. All right, I want to shift gears a little bit um, and talk about a different tax credit. You had mentioned this idea of the public infrastructure tax credit to leverage private dollars into public infrastructure. Shinpei, does this speak to you? I mean, how is that a workable concept? I mean, this is really your area of expertise, right? Well, I actually I don't know much about the new market tax credit, mm -hmm. but I have to say that infrastructure, if we're talking about um, thinking about infrastructure in terms of providing access to basic services, to education, to jobs, um, I think that it's much, much harder these days with the infrastructure that we have. You know, the U.S. is rated 22nd in the world now. We used to be among one of the five, maybe number one, as recently as 20 years ago. Um, we're really falling behind. And I think that the inability to overcome this structural problem based on the state allocation of funding for transportation programs, the overemphasis on highway construction versus what is necessary in urban areas 
is really what has led us to this problem of not being able to open up access to all those opportunities. I mean, that is why people go to cities, right? right. Um, so even though we see this vast disparity in terms of income in cities and we see people um, accessing public services or social services to augment their income, they're still coming to these places because this is where you get the diversity of opportunities, <coughs> you get the, um, you get the uh, range of it, industry, and you need the infrastructure to make it happen. Um, I have to say, though, uh, these tax credit issues and all these kind of innovative financing issues are great, completely necessary. Uh, there isn't a humongous public appetite for increased taxes given the current political environment, so they're necessary. But we really have not dealt with a structural core problem, which is raising basic funding for infrastructure. Um, when I think about a national urban agenda, you know, once upon a time, we thought about a national infrastructure system, which was our highway system, our interstate highway system. It was great. It was based on economic development, connecting regions that were completely remote and out of and disconnected. It had, there was a defense reason. You know, Eisenhower calculated how long it would take to get the uh, U.S. Army across the country, and just it, was just it just took way too long without a highway system. So, you know, today we really have to rethink this. This, um, you know, it, we still need a national system, but this national system, we need to connect the cities. And then within the cities, we need a different idea of what it takes to power the cities with their mobility system. So that's just one slice of what it takes in terms of infrastructure. And without thinking about um, raising the money for it in a way that really makes sense, you know, indexing the inflation is a great idea for the gas tax, has not been indexed. It was last raised in 1993. People don't know it, but eight, you know our gas, our federal gas tax is 18 cents per gallon. Um, state gas tax uh, overall is much higher. There are people. There are cities with local gas tax. Chicago is one of them. So you know we're we're not thinking about these um, issues in a systemic way and expecting this infrastructure to magically appear. And this is you know this is like the skeleton of creating those opportunities, access to those opportunities. So what's being done, what do you see being done in terms of advocacy in Washington to try and get that kind of new thinking? <laughs> well, Washington, <coughs> Washington is hard. Mm -hmm. Washington has, <laughs> Washington, I think that actually, you know, I think the um, administration has done an incredible job given what the cards it has been dealt. Um, you know, recently the Office of Econo the Partnership for Sustainable Communities was completely, the funding was completely cut. Um, this, we're talking about system change, right? Like we're talking about cities are all about layers of systems. You, that's where you get the industries talking to each other, the knowledge spillovers, the agglomeration effects, all these like economic terms. The dynamism of cities comes from this system, which is also run in infrastructure. That is extremely difficult given the a uh, state of the maturity of our country. People love to keep power, power in balance. And so when you're asking people to cooperate, you have to give them something that they can trade, you know, give them some political capital to trade. And lately, the, with the fiscal austerity plan in, that's you know, a result of partisan politics, um, we've basically taken away a lot of the capital that allows people to, the elected officials to trade, I still really believe in a national vision. I think that um, we have resources that we in the city access that are not in the city, and we just don't think of it. And so I think that we need to think of this uh, uh, in, like, in a balance of what, is, what, are we, what are we about as a country. Mm -hmm. um, I think often, I also think that the state issue is a huge problem. And then finally, um, this, this idea of connecting grassroots and civic engagement with policy is a huge, I think it's a huge overlooked gap that needs to be addressed. Um, often policymakers at the federal level think of innovations as a workaround to policy. Policymakers at the national level of, are the, cons they're the builders of that structure. They want to maintain it. So, and, and, with, and these innovations at the grassroots level challenge that structure. So we have to do more work to prove that innovations can be translated up, but we need to bring the congressional members with us mm -hmm. and, um, and to make this happen. Yeah. It, uh, you know, you look at, it took the FAA, it took airports, air, um, 
<laughs> flights to be held up that's to get right. Congress to move. Right. So the Republican What's Party. The yeah, that's right. The Republican Party, you know, has this rule that they need to always return to the district every every week, and mm -hmm. they couldn't go home because of the sequestration and the cuts in the um, aviation right. services. Exactly. Um, another topic entirely: guns, incarceration, um, crime control. Sometimes I feel like it's. Uh, is it fair to say these are urban issues? And in fact, it is. And it's clearly tied to education. It's clearly tied to the school to prison pipeline. Um, Mark Griffith, you, do you think we're moving in a more positive direction on these issues under Obama? Around, I mean, the gun control debate is one thing, and we'll get to that in a minute. But more broadly, in terms of the economic future and um, sort of the, the, the racial um, discriminate, discriminatory effects of the criminal justice system? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Um, no, I, I don't. Uh, I, wouldn't, I can't just leave it there. But uh, no, because I, I think that you're right. I think it's, it's hard to sort of focus on what the issues are. There's, a, there's been a lot of talk about guns, there's been a lot of talk in New York City, particularly around um, stop and frisk and, and police tactics. And it makes it very difficult to kind of, you know, um, navigate your way through that and try to think of, of public policy that, that can cut through all of that. Um, in New York City in particular, I don't think... Um, <clears throat> The, the conversation around stop and frisk, for instance, has been this conversation between, you know, um, it's, it's been a, there's been this assumption that crime has been going down in New York City, and it has been going down as a result of, um, of, of stop and frisk. And yet, on, you have this national conversation going on about guns that is completely sort of divorced from what people are experiencing um, day to day in, in, with gun violence. So when I talked before about when you asked me what the, the most important issues were, I said crime, and that's actually not it. It's, it, it's, it's violence, mm -hmm. and, it, and, it's, and it's public safety. And the violence in public safety, and the, the insecurity that people feel is not just, of, although, you know, particularly in black community, you, you know, there's insecurity that people feel between one another, but there's also an insecurity that people feel with the police and not feeling as though they are real peacekeepers, right. um, but they're protect protecting of, of a, pertin of, uh, a certain class and of property and are not really um, our allies. Uh, and I don't think that um, the Obama administration, I don't think Obama himself has, has, I think he's been scared of that conversation, has not addressed it um, whatsoever. But I don't think you can talk about gun violence and crime in this in, in, in this in this country without addressing that as well. Yeah. So what are the prospects for um, addressing gun violence in a way that will impact the cities? Not just the prospects, but what are the, what are the um, sort of proposals that should be on the table and considered different from what was on the table just as a result of Newtown? Dorian, you, you've done some work on this, right? I haven't done any work, but I'm out. I'm, I'm a little out there on this issue mm -hmm. because um, being from Chicago and knowing that, and especially the neighborhood I grew up in, young black kids are getting shot every single day, mm -hmm. and an assault weapons ban and a background check, as as much as I agree with that, is not going to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. It's just not, and because it's handguns that kids kids are acquiring illegally. Right. So that that's the problem. I'm I'm actually. This is why I'm out there. I, want, I just want to repeal the Second Amendment. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think we should have... There's no reason why the right to a gun should be more important than other fundamental human rights. Mm -hmm. It just makes no sense, right? So let's just repeal it. Nobody should be allowed to have a gun, period. Right. How would that fly in Louisiana, I know, I Mayor Moria? <laughs> no one could get elected to nothing. <laughs> 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 you have, you have, uh, you know, you have a, you have a hunting culture. Mm -hmm. You know, I had an experience. Uh, <laughs> I was in a legislature 20 years ago, and uh, I proposed, uh, I filed a 
a state bill to ban assault weapons. Mm -hmm. And I represented a district in New Orleans at five public housing developments. Uh, for the committee hearing, I got the police to bring 50 assault weapons to the committee room. Mm -hmm. Put them all on the table. I convinced a uh, colleague of mine, because <clears throat> he was in the moment, uh, who happened to be a Republican who represented the suburbs, to vote in favor of this assault weapons ban. By the time we had committee meetings in the morning, then we had lunch, then we had sessions in the afternoon. By the time the sessions came, he, call, he came over to my desk and said, man, I don't know what I did, but my phones are jammed with callers who are irate because the National Rifle Association had pulled the trigger on its very highly organized grassroots community engagement effort. Now, this is before the Internet. This is their ability to call 10 people who call 10 people who call 10 people who call 10 people. And all of a sudden, he was inundated, inundated. He just threw his hands up and said, I thought I was doing the right thing. He says, but I can't vote for this on the floor. And beware, I think they're going to come after a whole bunch of us. And they're going to scare people off. Sorry, I wanted to help you. But that's just the way it was and the way it is. And so the, 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 a lot of the, the culture and a lot of smaller communities in the South, hunting is big. Mm -hmm. And when you can create a sense that any gun safety measure is going to make it more difficult for people to hunt <coughs> uh, and enjoy uh, sports, uh, people, for example, in Louisiana, will go on a fishing trip with a handgun. Say, so why do they go on a fishing trip with a handgun? Because one of the things you might encounter when you're fishing are alligators who might just all of a sudden show up and be within two feet of you. And an alligator is a very quiet, you know, surreptitious animal. You can't hear. They make no noise. And then all of a sudden they're there. And I'm just trying to paint a picture yeah. uh, a while on a regional divide. But we've had to work very hard. And we obviously haven't been successful enough to draw a line to say that this gun safety legislation is not going to affect hunting. Mm -hmm. It's not going to affect sportsmen. Most of these folks are people who easily pass background checks, who want to own not 100 guns, but but perhaps one gun. But it's interesting because you mentioned the Second Amendment and, and is the history of the Second Amendment and how the Second Amendment ended up in the Bill, Bill of Rights. And it was a political compromise uh, because John Madison needed a southern state to vote for the Bill of Rights. And the southern states at the time were concerned about slave revolts, hmm. slave revolts. So they were malicious, organized malicious. Uh, self quote preservation and defense compacts. It's interesting, it, and it was part of also the history of a country whose revolutionary army began as a ragtag group of individuals. Uh, people who had bolted away from the British Army. I mean, George Washington was a British Army officer who left, in effect, to join the revolution. It's important to understand, so there were some circumstances that were present in those times that led to the Second Amendment, and it, I think it's a, it's a healthy discussion and a healthy debate uh, about the Second Amendment, but I say to constitutionalists, you know, we don't consider the First Amendment to be absolute, right? We have libel laws, we have slander laws, we have all sorts of things. I mean, every constitutional provision has reasonable limitations imposed on it uh, by statute, by custom, by law. So, I mean, I think it's an interesting thing. And I mean, to answer your question, it would be, you know, the, the Second Amendment is held dear uh, in not only in Louisiana, but in many, many southern states. And I would venture in rural areas. This is one of those places where, you know, there's a, there's a divide in thought 
between rural and urban, urban and now suburban communities. Yeah. Although I didn't hear a whole lot of pe white people defending the right to bear arms when the Black Panthers were showing off their <laughs> Yeah, weapons. right. <laughs> Um, we're going to go to audience questions in just a second, so put your hand up now and somebody will come around with a mic. Before we do that, I want to put another question on the table. Is, last one from me is, if you were an advisor to President Obama and he asked you to define the urban agenda and asked you what he thought or what you thought he should do in the remainder of his term, what would you say? Um, Mark, you want to take the first shot at that? Well, I, I think he should act like they exist. You know, I mean, I, I think that, no, I mean, and, and, which is, I'm not, sh I mean, I think explicitly is what I mean. Um, and I think that for a long time, cities have become, um, you know, uh, it, taboo on the national landscape because it, it represents dark people and, and, and immigrants and crime and all these different things that people feel sort of represents chaos. And um, I feel like the president has been beat back on that. And again, where, I, where he started with a very robust conversation around um, a progressive vision for, for cities, just while, I don't, while I'm not saying that they're not, very, they're not progressive or they're not policies embedded in his work that are important, I don't think that the conversation around cities is, is is given a priority. I don't think it's on the forefront of of his agenda. I don't think it's dis I don't think it's part of the national conversation yeah. right now. Um, and so I would just say, you know, start with naming it, talking about it, and recognizing, you know, some of these divides that exist between rural um, and urban America. Shinpei, mm -hmm. what about you? Well, I'm going to talk about infrastructure. Um, you know, I think that there's great regional dis uh, differences in variety across the country. Um, we should recognize that these regions have different needs. I think there's different levels of uh, infrastructure investments that would give you the return on investment that pe the public deserves. And I think that that return can represent social and environmental concerns. Um, specifically, I think that there should be greater allocation for funding public transit I think I don't think I think there should be um, you know thinking about fixing our system first before thinking about building more. Um, I I think specifically for cities, um, looking at how uh, these systems um, operate together would be really important. I think you know cities are also on in the longer term they're the greatest consumers of energy, and their greatest emitters of carbon. And if we don't, if we want to put aside the energy debate, which is significant given the uh, new oil reserves that are being discovered in the states these days, um, uh, you know, at some point we're going to be energy um, exporters, not importers. So, um, you know, we have to really think about dampening demand of energy. And the three areas are like right, are you know, ready to go in cities: transportation, buildings, and energy efficiency. With um, you know, energy production and um, smart grids. And those are three things that can happen almost right away. The technology exists, and we just need to change the structure of how that funding is allocated. Right. And some of which the president has spoken about. Right. Mm -hmm. Dorian. So I, I would say the, the dual problem of unemployment and bad jobs. And on the unemployment front, I think cities play an, an a key role here. So the question is, what's the plan for Detroit? What's the plan for <coughs> Buffalo? What's the plan for Gary? What's the plan for Youngstown? What's the plan for Poughkeepsie? What's the plan for Syracuse? What's the plan? What's the future? Are we just going to close those cities down? What's the future of those cities? What industries can we encourage to be built there? So that's the first half. And then the second half is the problem of bad jobs. So it's not only unemployment. And this is related to the income inequality question. 40% of our jobs roughly right now, 40% of the jobs in our economy are low-wage jobs, meaning people could work full-time full -time and still live in poverty. And most people who want to work full-time can't even work full-time. Right? Most people are involuntarily working part-time. So the, the problem of low-wage work, of bad jobs, and by the way, the jobs of the future are low-wage jobs. Eight of the 12 fastest-growing occupations are low-wage jobs. So that's our future. 
it's actually it's our present and our future, right? Is this low low wage economy? So we need to figure out how to fix bad jobs. One solution is unions. How do we give workers more bargaining power? And we see what's happening, right? We just saw workers at fast food establishments go on strike for a day a couple weeks ago. So uh, what, what's the plan for creating jobs, especially in dying cities, and then secondly, transforming bad jobs into good jobs? What's the federal plan? Right. All right, you have a question back. Who's got oh. the mic? Okay. Oh. Tell uh, how you doing? Talib Hudson, graduating uh, student in the Urban Policy Program here at Milano, big uh, A5 to my brother Mark Morial. Um, uh, how can we, uh, one of the things that frustrates me as a policy uh, student is uh, I feel like we don't talk about race in the context of urban policy enough, and I want to know how can we do that, and I want to contextualize that into three different points. One is that the decline of some cities, particularly New York, Newark, uh, Detroit, can be directly, directly attributed to the riots from the 60s, um, which were outgrowth of, of the frustration of, uh, of, of blacks to the, to the conditions that were going on, which haven't fully been addressed. You have Bruce Katz, Ed Glazer, Richard Florida, uh, promoting cities, but yet uh, race still gets continued to, to get left out. But then on the flip side of that, you have uh, uh, gentrification, a continued racial wealth gap, not just in the lower class, but in the middle class as well, and whitening of the cities. We have uh, Central Harlem and D.C., the black population declining, uh, stop and frisk, and that even goes into the, the issue of political power and the decline thereof that we talked about. So how can we effectively address race when we talk about urban policy, particularly the Obama agenda in which he doesn't seem to want to talk about race at all? Look, I, I think, you, yes, any discussion of cities and urban policy that doesn't ask important questions about race and class means that the discussion is incomplete. It's that simple. And while in the public discourse of politicians, people engage in some cases with extreme care and caution if we can't discuss it in the universities, where minds are being shaped, where ideas are being formed, where there is a, a, a need for candor and candid discussion, so I'd say as a student, call the question. Call the question in the class, call the question to professors. Is there a racial dimension? Is there a racial element? Is this problem some result of racial disparities? It's to be able to discuss it without getting bogged down only in a discussion about public policy and race, but to recognize its crucial and critical importance. Look, cities like Detroit, flight from cities, had everything to do to some extent. I shouldn't say everything to do. Had a large measure to do with race. The disinvestment and redlining of cities had to do with perceptions which were the outgrowth of race. I dealt with this issue when we dealt with the subprime crisis. And there were those who sought to promote a false narrative. That false narrative was the bank collapse occurred because banks were forced to lend to unworthy, <coughs> low income, borrowers of color. The only thing wrong with that argument is when you looked at the facts, the fact of the matter is that 60% of subprime loans were going to middle and higher income white borrowers who were refinancing mortgages on their home with a subprime loan. It didn't match the facts. So I called it in congressional testimony, these were weapons of mass deception where people were being deceived to believe one thing when the facts said something else. It's important, I think, to call the question and ask, but to do the analysis. It's one thing to say, I believe, I think, particularly in a setting where public policy is being shaped. I believe, I think, it's my sense that this is an element of that. It's another thing to say, I believe it's an element, but let me give you the rationale. Let me tell you why. We've looked at the impact of this. We've analyzed the impact of this. Therefore, and I would point you to a tool that we publish each and every year. 
It's called The State of Black America. It's available online. In the front of that book, we have what we call the Equality Index. We measure 300 data sets, <coughs> blacks, whites, and Latinos, and we measure them against each other. It's important pieces of information that one can use. So I really encourage students, professors, practitioners, and you know, one of the things that students and people in the public policy and academic sense can do is also work to distill the analysis in a way that people at the community level yeah. can grasp it, yes. get their arms around, understand it, Sometimes the role of public policy uh, is not only to analyze, but to translate. To translate it into a way that people can better understand it so that it's actionable information. Information that people can act on. So we, you know, we, we, we have to confront it. And now it's much more complex in the 21st century, right? Uh, because when we talked about race in 1960 and 1970, we meant, for the most part, blacks and whites. Now our communities and our nation includes Latinos who are from many parts of the world. Asians, who we may say, hey, but from different nationalities and backgrounds. We have a much more complicated, <coughs> dynamic, interesting mosaic and tapestry. So when you analyze it, it's not as plain as it might have been. And I encourage public policy students, professors, practitioners, those that are really in there looking at this, to not be afraid to delve into it, to delve into it, because I think to the extent that we delve into it, our policy responses can be smarter and better thought out. Yeah. Can I, can I respond to that, that question really quickly? Sure. Uh, just Two, two points, really quickly. The first one's very concrete. So many cities or states have mandatory environmental impact reviews but for zoning decisions or economic development decisions or policies. We could do a racial equity impact review, right? And there are a couple of these tools out there so that before any legislature passes a policy or makes certain kinds of decisions, you have to do a racial equity impact analysis to see if the policy either advances racial justice or advances race, right, or is racist, essentially. So, so that's just one concrete policy tool. And then just on your, just a second point, I wanna emphasize about whether the president talks about race or not. Um, the president, I'm sure, did not wanna talk about marriage equality, but he was forced to. Yeah. And, I, and I want us to always remember, this is the second term, a lot of us drank the Kool-Aid the first term. It's time to sober up. Barack Obama is not a magical Negro. He is a politician, a politician. He is the president of the United States, meaning he's supposed to represent us. We are supposed to be pressuring him. That's our, that's our job. We're supposed to be pushing him. And the successes that we saw in the first term, whether it was around marriage equality or now it's immigration, that's where you saw the most amount of mobilization by people and organizations. Right. Shinpei? I just want to offer also one additional very specific policy tool in infrastructure investment. You're often looking at um, formulas to kind of figure out how much money to give away. And a lot of those formulas are regressive. They look at what has happened in the past versus what is looking into the future. So if you add, if you add those kinds of indicators and expand what cost-benefit analysis is, what the benefits right. are, right. then you can include more and think about uh, future populations. And you know, one very specific aspect of that is uh, with our biggest infrastructure investment bill, which is a transportation one, actually, we are constantly allocating still based on like you know 1990s figures, where <laughs> right lately um, the amount of travel people are doing by private car has actually plateaued in right. spite of the recovery from the economic recession. So you know that there is some kind of change afoot. There are fewer licensed young drivers. 
there are fewer people there are more people moving to cities and taking advantage of public transit so something really significant is happening and you can use these policy tools to change it and it's happening in many dimensions related to this conversation I mean young people are driving less young people are vo voted more in 2012 than they did in 2008 um, I mean you can go on the generational change is radical yep hi uh, I have a question about infrastructure and voting um, kind of we didn't we didn't get to infrastructure that much where we talked about the tax credit for private investment um, for public infrastructure just something I'm really skeptical of I don't understand why tax credits for private companies to make public investment decisions is a better use of tax dollars than the government doing it itself um, and that this is kind of a frustration that I've started feeling about you know why aren't young people voting I kind of get the feeling sometimes that uh, government decisions are being privatized and and what am I voting for uh, if, if you know everything is now business improvement districts and everything like that that yes make everything look better and cleaner and safer and everything on the surface but are actually taking power out of out of the government putting it in private hands and so what good is voting anyway I don't really mean that I don't really mean that <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of the I'm not one of those young people um, <laughs> no 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 I absolutely believe in voting uh, it's just I think your answers to like civic engagement and everything to increase voting it's like I would like my government to take pride in the in public works mm -hmm. itself rather than trying to privatize them. Right. Yeah, and, and I think you know you in the perfect world, the public investments would be sufficient enough uh, to repair all the infrastructure that needs to be repaired, and we're sort of cycling because uh, when modern wastewater and water systems were created about a hundred years ago, or so. It was a technological innovation. How many of you all know what the term outhouse means? Yeah. <laughs> Any of y'all ever seen one? Well, people in communities not too far from where I grew up had outhouses in the 70s because they didn't have plumbing, they didn't have running water. The point is, is that we're cycling now. The life cycle of a lot of water and wastewater systems uh, is now 100 years old, so they need a significant dose of investment to upgrade it. So what the EPA has done is they've, they've issued compliance, uh, and compliance orders in a lot of communities, but then the communities find that in order to comply with the EPA's upgrade requirements, they need billions of dollars that are beyond the ability of their taxpayers to absorb. They can't get the support for the federal government, so they're looking for innovative ways to bring capital in to solve the problem. And that's why these tax credit ideas evolved more out of necessity uh, than out of some overriding, at least from my, my point of view, other than some sort of overriding view that it's a better way to do business. And uh, I was uh, in Beijing about three years ago uh, with a group of leaders looking at some of the infrastructure they're building there. So. The train station in Beijing is a beautiful train station. It's green, it's wonderful. And uh, the station master that took us on a tour said, you like this train station? I said, this is a great train station. He says, well, we're building about 100 like this. Hmm. I said, 100 like this? He says, yes. Some are a little bit smaller, some are this size, but this is a prototype for us. And we have really gotten away. Let me tell you where we have made significant infrastructure investments in military hardware, yeah. in military hardware, <laughs> in planes and ships and armaments and munitions. Infrastructure investment, if you consider it into hard things, things we build, we've increased significantly the investment we make in military infrastructure. So at the base of this, see this is the issue that has to be discussed. At the base of this, the larger question for the country is what are our priorities for the 21st century? Is it building new rail systems for our urban communities? Is it repairing the water and wastewater systems? Is it building 21st century schools that look better than prison facilities? Is it upgrading our parks and our playgrounds and adding recreational facilities so that children in urban communities have a positive, clean, healthy place to play? 
or is it continuing to build? And the numbers are, are very, very dramatic. You know, our military budget of almost $800 billion a year is, I believe the number is, twice as large as the next 10 countries combined. We have a massive investment, but we don't debate, right? We don't have the, the old debate we had in the 1970s was guns v. butter, right? We had a debate, and we've gotta have that debate because it's not feasible to do all of these things. They're the people who say, let's invest, increase investments in domestic needs, domestic infrastructure, investments in people. People say, I'm for that. Let's keep taxes at the barest minimum. I'm for that. Let's also have the most powerful and dynamic military to protect ourselves in the world. I'm for that. The problem is the math doesn't add up. And I think to your question, there's a larger value question that we have to have as a country, and that those are what our priorities going to be. Right. And I'm sorry, but we're going to have to wrap it there. That was a great way to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mayor Morial. And thank the panel as well. <laughs>